Today on the Family Vacationer, we're looking at a 200 mile long string of barrier islands and spits off the coast of North Carolina and Virginia. Episode 23 is all about the Outer Banks and it starts right now. Welcome to the Family Vacationer with Rob and Danny, the go to podcast for families on the move. Welcome, friends. I'm Danny. And I'm Rob, and this is episode 23 of the Family Vacationer. Hey, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss an episode of the show. And, and we'd also appreciate you giving the podcast a really good rating if you enjoy the show. We're going to be starting a newsletter soon where you can receive travel deals and so you'll know in advance when upcoming episodes will drop and what we're going to be covering. We'd also love for you to follow us on Facebook at the Family Vacationer Podcast and Instagram at the Family Vacationer. On today's show, we welcome Lee Nettles. Lee is the Executive Director of Outer Banks Visitors Bureau. We're very excited to talk to him today. And, and Dan, I have to admit right off the bat, this is one area of the country I've not been to, and it's something that I think I need to remedy pretty soon. You do. I've been there, and you definitely need to remedy that soon. So when we're talking about the Outer Banks, we're talking about the city of Duck and Southern Shores. Those are two of the newest additions to the Outer Bank. Additionally, there's Kitty Hawk, Kill Devil Hills, Nags Head, Manteo, Wing Cheese, Rodanthe, Waves, Salvo, Avon, Buxton, Frisco, and Hatteras. So if you're like me, and I think Dan as well, American history is, is something that we both are into. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's always interested me, and this area has so much to offer from the Lost Colony at Roanoke to the Wright Brothers' efforts at flight. This area has tons and tons of history. That is definitely true. You know, one word you're hearing more and more is the word over-tourism. And the word has come to represent, unfortunately, all the negative things associated with tourism. But this is one set of beaches where, despite the millions of visitors, each quaint beach town and fishing village has managed to really retain its own sense of personality and hasn't gotten drowned by the t-shirt shops and all that sort of thing every quarter of a mile. However, don't be fooled and think there's nothing to do. There are outdoor sports activities, dolphin tours, water slides, fishing, plenty of things to keep a family busy and having fun. That's true. So at this point, let's bring in Lee Nettles. Uh, let's bring in Lee to talk more about this beautiful area. Lee, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, we opened the show mentioning the history of the Outer Banks and how the area is perfect a perfect option for people tired of over-tourism and T-shirt shops every other every quarter mile. So in your mind, what makes the Outer Banks a good option for a family vacation? Where to begin? I mean, uh, ultimately, it's the 100 miles of shoreline. And, and what you just mentioned, uh, even, even on our busiest weekend or week, you can find a spot of beach that, that you can call your own. It's relatively uncrowded. Um, we do have uh, towns that have bigger populations and, and, uh, and you can find a hustle and bustle if you're looking for that. But uh, unlike most other areas, um, you, can, you can get out on the Cape Hatteras National Seashore, for instance, and literally not see another person in either direction. So it's just, wow. it's just a vast, uh, wide open, undeveloped uh, stretch of beach and and then i mean as as we'll get into we've just got some amazing attractions it's um it's kind of an embarrassment of riches as a tourism promotion guy but uh but we're really proud of the area i want to ask you lee about the different communities that encompass the outer banks and uh you know every community typically has its own own personality and so i want to talk to you about the places to stay things to do places to eat. I'm going to go ahead and put my plug in for Mad Crabber, but we'll, we'll hear your advice on that. Can you tell us about the different areas? Sure. So the, the area that I'm responsible for promoting is uh, Dare County. And so that includes everything from uh, the northernmost town of Duck to, and, and I'll just kind of work from north to south. It's Duck, Southern mm -hmm. Shores, Kitty Hawk, Kill Devil Hills, and Nags Head. Mm -hmm. Those are the five beach towns uh, in an area that is, used to be Body Island, but it's uh, kind of filled in. It's now a peninsula, and we refer to it as the Northern Beaches. So that's, okay. so that's one of the more populated areas um, in general. And, and then there's a, a second island area that's just to the east or just to the west, um, kind of inland, called 
Roanoke Island, and that has the town of Manio. It's a, a charming waterfront uh, area, with obviously island, so it's surrounded by water and some really uh, unique claims to history. And if you move further south uh, along the ocean front, you get onto uh, Hatteras Island, which has mm -hmm. seven different villages that are interspersed along uh, just completely undeveloped areas, the, the Cape Hatteras National sea Seashore. So you are, when you're traveling on Hatteras Island, for instance, you're literally on a two lane road called NC-12. Mm -hmm. And on one side, you can see the ocean just over the sand dunes. And on the other side, you see uh, the, the Pamlico Sound. And uh, so it's a thin little ribbon, a chain of barrier islands. And um, it's it's such a natural experience. I mean, we're shaped by wind and water. And uh, I mean, you really you really feel that when you're out here. It feels it feels exotic, although it's, you know, a half day uh, drive from much of the, the eastern half of the United States. Um, so in terms of the, the towns and the villages, and, and I guess that's one thing to point out that while we do have these uh, six towns and nine villages, we, we don't have any cities. And, um, and it kind of feels right. like that too when you're out here. Uh, so, you know, I've, I've joked around about how I want to have a big waste basket at the bridge when you drive in and people can drop their neckties or uh, shiny, sho <laughs> shiny shoes in there. Yeah. You know, we don't really have any uh, room for that out here. Um, yeah. So, so Duck, the northernmost town, is uh, it it has a a village feel to it. It's walkable. It has a, a kind of a signature element, which is a boardwalk that stretches on the sound side and kind of curves around. And you'll find um, quite a few shops located on the boardwalk, as well as some uh, great restaurants. Um, you mentioned the the Sanderling. Uh, hotel property mm -hmm. that's in Duck. That's um, just at the practically at the northern border um, of of Duck, and, and then from there you would move into uh, the next county up, which is uh, Currituck County. Um, also okay. part of the geological Outer Banks, but uh, not part of the area that we represent. Um, I don't I don't know how much you want me to keep going into the town. There are a bunch of towns and villages, but I, generally speaking. Um, you can, if, if, you're, if you want to have more conveniences, more shopping, more stores, more restaurants, mm -hmm. that's kind of the, the northern beaches, those uh, first six towns okay. that I mentioned. Um, if you want a little bit slower pace and more of that charming quaint waterfront uh, town, it's almost like Mayberry on the water, then Manio mm -hmm. and Roanoke Island are probably what you're looking for. Uh, commercial fishing and boat building um, and, and just incredible history. And then Hatteras Island is, uh, sometimes we call that uh, Outer Banks Unplugged. It just, it, it feels um, a little more rustic um, and just away. And, and part of that's just the relationship of, um, of those villages because the, the, it's all Cape Hatteras National Seashore, but you're mm -hmm. driving along these 20 mile stretches of nothing but that two lane road yeah. and then you'll come upon two or three villages that are side by side and you just kind of go from one to the other and then you'll be back on that two lane road with nothing um, and then you'll hit another village uh, so it's just like little jewels I guess in, in the in the natural crown I think it's great that you can because there's some families that like to just get off the grid and don't want anything around, don't want anybody around, and you guys have that. But then there's also some families that, that do want, you know, some some of the good places to eat and some things mm -hmm. to do, some shopping, and you've got that too. So it really, you really do have it all there. Yeah, you can definitely find what you're looking for. And um, what the Outer Banks Visitors Bureau, uh, we they have welcome centers and phone rooms and people that are just, um, they're locals and they're experts on the area. And we're, we're here for you uh, to try and find the experiences that are just right for you. Hey, I want to ask you really quick, you know, when it, my family and I, we took a trip there we, and we had a big group with us mm -hmm. and we got, we were in Avon on the sound side. We uh, rented a, a three-story house. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, is that the, 
Is that what you would recommend if, if anybody were planning to travel or are there other more convenient, easier places to stay? Um, so one of the things that makes the Outer Banks unique is the, uh, the abundance of vacation rental homes. Yeah. That's about 80% of the occupancy collections. The lodging revenue that we get is from uh, uh, the vacation rental homes. And yeah. it's a great experience, particularly uh, during these COVID days, because you can literally leave your house, drive all the way to your vacation rental home, use a, a push-in key code, check in um, without seeing or interacting with another human. Yeah. And then you, if you're on the ocean front or sound front, you walk out and you have your own stretch of sand and you can just begin vacation right away. So vacation rental homes are um, definitely a popular choice. Mm -hmm. And we have them in, in all of the different areas of the towns and villages. We also have, we have, um, we have a few chain hotels uh, like a Ramada, Hilton Garden, a Town Place Suites, a couple of Comfort Inns, Days Inn, but um, but but really the area, whether we're talking about lodging or restaurants, is dominated by the mom and pop chain. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So some real unique experiences, uh, cottage courts, little old school motels, um, a lot of mm -hmm. fantastic campgrounds, uh, everything from you know rustic tent to Mm -hmm. RV, um, little cabins, cabins with a K, I guess, um, but uh, some National Park Service uh, campgrounds. And I, you know, I haven't even mentioned the, um, one of the cool things about our area is that it's one county, but we've got three different National Park Service sites, um, Wright Brothers National Memorial, mm -hmm. Fort Raleigh National Historic Site, which is the first attempted colonization by the English in the New World. And then Cape Hatteras National Seashore. And it just so happens that each one of those island areas that I mentioned before has its own National Park Service site. So um, it, visitors should realize that you're, you're probably going to be driving around a bit um, uh, and you need to yeah. kind of schedule that in and we can certainly help you with it. Uh, but it, it's um, you'll want to start out by trying to kind of pick a home base. And, and when you're like you did in Avon, uh, choosing mm -hmm. an actual home, it kind of makes it easier. You can vacation with other families, for instance, and um, yeah. put them together for meals and that kind of thing. Uh, so a lot to offer there. What are your favorite places to eat if you were going to go out with your family? Now, as a tourism promotion professional, yeah. I would say that I love all my <laughs> uh -oh. children equally. Exactly. Um, <laughs> it, we're, I mean, obviously we're, we're, we're on the Outer Banks. We're, we're jutting yeah. out in the ocean, 30, 40 miles off the coast of North Carolina, uh, where a couple of ocean currents converge. Mm -hmm. um, so we're real close to the deep water and charter fishing. So seafood is a big deal. Uh, and you can pretty much mm -hmm. get, a whether it's soft shell crabs or um, tuna or uh, mahi, um, oysters, you can find fresh seafood pretty much any time of year and it varies, you know, seasonally. So uh, we get a lot of interest in seafood, uh, whether it's mm -hmm. fried or just kind of straight off the boat. Um, and there are a variety of restaurants that do that extremely well. Mm -hmm. um, we have a couple of restaurants like uh, uh, Bass Nights Lone Cedar on the, on the causeway in Nags Head that um, does everything locally sourced, um, which is a pretty fantastic option. Um, but really, I, I think it kind of comes down to uh, determining what what vibe or what area you're most interested in, and you'll be able to find some excellent restaurants that are nearby. You kind of spoke a little bit about this, but more and more families are trying to incorporate some edu educational learning into a vacation, and you guys have so much history there. Um, can you talk about some of the landmarks that, that families should really, that are must-see? I, I would definitely start with the three National Park Service sites. Um, yeah. At Wright Brothers, I mean, that, of course, uh, tells the tale of the uh, Orville and Wilbur's first flight in uh, December 17th, 1903. We have a commemoration every year on that day. Um, December 17th can be kind of raw on the Outer Banks, uh, weather-wise <laughs> sometimes, but it, it's definitely worth making. Uh, the, the, the monument 
and all the, the National Park Service sites right now, because of COVID-19, the welcome centers are closed, but the restrooms are open, the grounds are open. Mm. Um, the lighthouses, unfortunately, are closed to climbing at the moment, but, uh, but you can still go out there and get your photograph with the lighthouse. We've got, in fact, five different lighthouses in the, in the area. Um, so oh, wow. you can do a windshield tour of all those lighthouses. We have, um, we have car ferries and passenger ferries that take you across uh, the Hatteras Inlet over to Ocracoke, which is a cool trip. Um, it is a very cool trip. I'm glad we did that. Yeah, we've got a we've got a, a replica colonial sailing ship called the Elizabeth II that's um, just oh, on wow. the on the waterfront in Manio, and um, the like Fort Raleigh tells the tale of those first English uh, attempted uh, colonization in the New World. That was like twenty years before Jamestown. Um, mm -hmm. Those colonists, as you may know, uh, it turns out they we 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 lost them. By the time the right. ship of supplies came back in uh, 1587, they couldn't find the colonists. And there, it's the oldest American mystery, I guess, like uh, Outer mm. Banks CSI or something. But there's, <laughs> a, uh, there's a summer uh, performance called The Lost Colony Outdoor Drama. It's the longest running outdoor symphonic drama in America. And uh, that, that runs during the summer. It's a great time for, for families. Um, and and then you know I mean there's a there's a plethora of other historic sites uh, Chick Macomico Life Saving Station uh, this was a precursor to the Coast Guard uh, they oh, right. life saving stations up and down the coast but um, but they were especially important in the Outer Banks which has the nickname the Graveyard of the Atlantic um, because mm -hmm. of the sandbars that move around and the I mean, there are literally more than 3,000 ships that were sank off of the coast of the Outer Banks. Some of them are wow. visible from the shore, in fact. Um, but there's a place called the Graveyard of the Atlantic Museum in Hatteras Village where you can uh, dig deeper yeah. into those uh, tales. Um, other great stories, the, the first uh, all um, African-American life-saving crew was at Pea Island um, mm -hmm. and, and the Freedmen's Colony, which is... Uh, one of the when the Union forces took over the Outer Banks, they created this area called the Freedmen's Colony in Roanoke Island, where escaped slaves um, would venture to, and um, schools were started, and it was it was a thriving community for a while. So there wow. there are just so many tales, and mm -hmm. one of the things that I that I find coolest about the Outer Banks is um, a lot of those old family names from you know centuries ago are still present in the Outer Banks. Nice. We, you know, we did the the ferry ride out to Ocracoke. If I remember right, if you have kids, um, they might find it interesting. Isn't there pirate history there as well on that island? Oh yeah, um, it's it's said that uh, Blackbeard Edward Tench, uh, his last residence was on Ocracoke Island uh, before he was he was killed. Um, so they have a festival out there to commemorate it. Um, but yeah, I mean, aside from the I guess what you would say, uh, the professional pirates with all those shipwrecks, um, supposedly the, the locals were uh, fairly opportunist. It was um, like a shipwreck would come ashore and, um, and it was kind of like a Walmart coming ashore. <laughs> In fact, uh, one, of, one of the uh, towns on the Outer Banks is called uh, Kill Devil Hills. Yeah. And the Kill Devil, uh, the lore has it that... Um, that the ships would run aground and the locals would go out there and strip it before the insurers would come down from Virginia. And one of the, one of the things that they were uh, most eager to get were the barrels of rum that were rumored to be uh, strong enough to kill the devil. Oh. And so they would buy those <laughs> barrels of rum and the rum wouldn't go bad. So they could, yeah. uh, you know, just kind of have them and, and um, drink them accordingly. But um, I guess that's part of the, the fun, uh, aspects or the names like Nags Head is uh, another lore where um, supposedly people would put lanterns around uh, the neck of a uh, nag, a horse, mm -hmm. and walk it along the, uh, the shoreline. And boats that were out at sea would think that it was another ship and that it was clear water. And um, so they would get too close in, run aground, and then uh, get stripped of their cargo. cargo. So, Oh, wow. There's Head for you. Speaking of the lore, when I was planning a trip for the folks that went to the Sanderling Resort, 
there were wild horses, like tours, so you could go to see the wild horses. What's the story behind that? Uh, yet another shipwreck, uh, some Spanish Mustangs <laughs> that uh, made it to shore. And uh, some of those are up in the Currituck area that you mentioned. And, and some, uh, some of them are uh, down south, uh, another county to the south. But when, when you're um, in our area, there, there are tour providers and you can uh, just reserve your space and, and head out there and see the wild horses. But it's real important uh, to not feed them. You know, you're tempted to give them an apple or something like that, but it uh, kind of kind of ruins the, the ecosystem there. I've seen some pictures of the horses. They're beautiful animals. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's it's iconic of the area for sure. Right up, right up there with lighthouses. Well, understanding that you know things are a little different in the world right now with COVID, so we we want to ask you, you know, where do the community stand right now on the reopening process? We, uh, because there are a couple of main ways to get into the Outer Banks, of, like two bridges leading in and a ferry. Yeah we were able to close down access, uh, visitor access. In fact, I think we may have been the first county in the country to close the visitation when all this happened, started um, in the middle of March. And we remained closed to visitors until mid-May. Um, but we, once the announcement was made that we were going to reopen, uh, we saw a really strong uh, booking um, mm -hmm. and we started getting notices or mentions with uh, other media, at the, I think Forbes cited us as a, as a top place to go mm. and post COVID or in a COVID age. And part of that, as we've been talking about, just the 100 miles of shoreline and the fact that you can have a vacation experience, but um, still maintain separation from other folks. Um, you could say that we were social distancing before there was such a thing. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's different for sure. The um, while we are open, we're, we're kind of following the state mandates on uh, face masks are mandatory right now. Yeah. And, um, and we're also with a 50% maximum capacity on the restaurants. Um, but then they're also doing takeout and delivery. And, uh, and we're starting to do creative things like, uh, you know, set up uh, picnic tables and parking lots and uh, other things like that. So it's a little bit different. We would just ask people to be uh, be a bit more patient, and but but definitely more than anything. I mean, just do those simple steps: to wash your hands, uh, mm -hmm. yep. social distance, and and wear a face covering. It's um, mm -hmm. it's it's not hard to do. It makes such a right. difference. And for an area that's so wholly reliant on tourism, it's um, it's it's vital to our survival in more ways than one, right. both yeah. economically and physically. So. Appreciate everybody's help there. Mm -hmm. So, again, given the current reality, we know that events and festivals this year, you know, people uh, need to just be patient with, with all the different tourist areas. But looking to 2021, what are the, some, some of the iconic events and festivals in the Outer Banks? Fall really gets into some serious uh, festival season. So uh, it's, it's, it's so painful to watch those events slipping. But... Um, some of our perennial favorites yeah. uh, would be the Outer Banks Seafood Festival, which uh, brings together you know, 20 or so uh, local restaurants serving fresh seafood and as well as bands and, and uh, just educational vendors and that kind of thing. So it's a great time. That happens in Nags Head in October, typically. Um, we have the Outer Banks Marathon, which is uh, going to be in its 15th year, which has half marathon and fun runs and all sorts of other ancillary events. Um, that typically happens in, uh, in October, November. Um, and let's see, we've got um, the Taste of the Beach, which is a culinary event uh, that happens in local restaurants, but then also they have some uh, group uh, dining things that happen along with that. We've got surf fishing tournaments. We've got kiteboarding. We've got professional surfing uh, tournaments. Um, we've got music events that happen uh, throughout the year. It's really, I mean, the events are kind of a reflection yeah. of, uh, well, not kind of, definitely a reflection of, of the area and just <laughs> how diverse it is. And, and also really in keeping with um, just the natural setting and, and the, the, the wind and water. 
you know, I forgot to mention uh, Jockey's Ridge, the tallest sand dune on the East Coast, uh, which is a great place for families. It's, it's like one of the top attractions for us. That's in Mag's Head. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing about that is um, it doesn't come, you don't have to have any instructions. I mean, kids immediately know what to do. They just tear yeah. up, start running up the dune. Yeah. But, uh, but they have hang, hang gliding tournaments or uh, uh, contests out there. And they also, um, it's, it's a real popular spot just for flying a kite. The winds are always uh, prevalent in the Outer Banks, which is mm -hmm. part of the reason the Wright brothers came here. Uh, so, sure. so those are right. some of the, the, the fun festivals that we have. What's some local information that visitors would need to know about the Outer Banks? Well, I, I think I think we've talked about the most important thing right now. Mm -hmm. Just uh, with with COVID, um, yeah, we, we want folks to be safe, uh, be smart, but still have fun, and we can we can help you do that for sure. Um, kind of on a lighter note, I think I would um, I would give you an insider tip. We love these. There's a lighthouse out here called the Body Island Lighthouse, but when you see it uh, spelled, it's B O D I E. So Okay. A common common mishap is you get visitors that uh, Bodie looking for the Bodie lighthouse. The Bodie, uh, but 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 you'll you'll reveal <laughs> yourself if you do that. So uh, so ask for the Bodie lighthouse, and and, and of course there's another uh, story behind that. Um, it's named after a, a, a family that, uh, in fact, there's a plaque inside the lighthouse that uh, that calls it the uh, the Bodie's lighthouse. Um, but there's also a lore that goes along that says that um, part of the name is derived from sailors washing up on the shores from the shipwrecks and things like that. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, awesome. Well, Lee, thank you so much for your time, and we appreciate you coming on the show. Yeah, it was my pleasure, guys. Uh, thanks for having me on, and, and hopefully we'll all get out there traveling uh, more freely soon. But, uh, but yeah. don't let it hold you back. Come on down. Bring a mask, but, uh, but we'll, yeah. we'll show you a good time for sure on the Outer Banks. Sounds awesome. good. Thank, thank you, sir. Well, that's it for this show. Join us in two weeks as we take a look at Gulf Shores Orange Beach on the Alabama coast. Till next time. Thank you for listening to the Family Vacationer. Make sure and subscribe to hear more of Rob and Danny.